Hello, and welcome to our training for on-premises PSTN connectivity using Cloud Connector Edition. Uh, my name is Brian Nice. I am a principal program manager in our Skype product group. And uh, this session is going to take you through uh, our Cloud Connector Edition uh, solution uh, based on our uh, latest 1.4.1 uh, release. So let's start right at the beginning and talk a little bit about what Cloud Connector really is and what the architecture of Cloud Connector is. Uh, is. Now, when I think of Cloud Connector, I think of it as an extension to the Skype for Business online service. So yes, we're going to get down into the kind of the nerd knob aspect and talk a little bit about, you know, what's actually there and what it looks like and all the bits and bobs. But in reality, you, we really should be thinking about Cloud Connector as an extension to the online service, right? Providing some critical functionality that we need uh, via the on-premises world. Now, in this particular instance, that critical functionality is PSTN interconnect, right? So the scenario that we're looking at here for Cloud Connector is my users live in the cloud. They are uh, consuming Skype for Business Online. They are consuming Cloud PBX, but instead of having the PSTN connectivity come from the Office 365 cloud via PSTN calling, for example, it's coming through the Cloud Connector architecture onto an on-premises gateway environment. Now that could be an existing um, set of trunks that you have coming in or PRIs that you have coming in from an existing uh, telephony provider. Uh, could be anything that's really on our UCOIP uh, site. But the intent here is that the user still lives in the cloud, but we're providing the telephony interconnect on premises. And we achieve that by deploying what we call a cloud connector appliance. And effectively the appliance is a hypervisor. Uh, so it's a dedicated uh, server running uh, Hyper-V that has a set of uh, sealed virtual machines, if you will, um, deployed on top of it, right? And those virtual machines, uh, four of them, in fact, perform some very discrete functions, uh, very similar to the functions that you might be used to in a traditional Skype for business um, server on-premises deployment. As functionalities like Edge, for example, mediation servers, um, storage or, or CMS, uh, if you will, um, and even domain controller instances. Now, first and foremost, want to realize that this is a, uh, a dedicated appliance, and the components that you see here uh, work in tandem with each other. But for example, the Active Directory piece that you see here, it's simply a domain controller for the purposes of managing the Cloud Connector environment. It has nothing to do with your on-premises Active Directory. It doesn't talk to your on-premises Active Directory. You don't have to replicate anything with it. It's its own little forest inside of that Cloud Connector appliance. Okay? So there is no dependency on your internal Active Directory um, when you see a domain controller for Cloud Connector, uh, as you see on the slide here. Now. When we get this interconnect in play, right, this appliance built out and we have these SIP connections to our gateways and to the uh, public switch telephone network, the dial plans that the users use, right, if you remember back to our, our kind of our enterprise voice days, right, dial plans are all about codifying users' dialing habits, right? The dial plan is assigned online based on where the user is located. There are options that you can configure online, for example, to restrict international dialing, um, and I'll show you those coming up a little bit later in this presentation. Um, external DNS would be pointing at Skype for Business, right? This is not a, uh, a, a traditional on-premises deployment, right? For those of you that are familiar with the, the concept of a traditional Skype for Business server deployment on-premises uh, in a hybrid type mo uh, mode, that would require the DNS records to be pointed on-prem and all that fun stuff. Nope, Cloud Connector doesn't do that. Right. Although Cloud Connector does have some hybrid configuration that you're going to see in a little bit, from the DNS perspective, all of your external DNS records um, uh, for the purposes of uh, external SIP are reporting to online. Right. So auto discover, the, the link discover, for example, uh, those records are still going to online. Of course, you will have DNS records that point to Cloud Connector. They have to. Right. But your SRV records and things of that nature all pointing to the Skype for Business Online environment. Now, it is key to note that in this version, 141 of Cloud Connector, uh, there is no support for coexistence with an on-premises deployment of Skype for Business or any other flavor of uh, software on-premises, right? So Cloud Connector is meant to be deployed uh, in environments that do not have 
any type of on-premises deployment, Skype for Business, Link Server 2013, et cetera. Media traffic currently flows via the mediation server. All right, so there's no media bypass um, implemented as of yet. Um, but as you'll see in a little bit, we'll take you through some call flow scenarios and kind of point out why that's not maybe as big of a deal as, as uh, you may be thinking. Now, the users themselves, of course, they're being serviced out of the cloud, but uh, those users could be you know, on-premises users that were created in Active Directory that are synced to the cloud and then provide the services from uh, Skype for Business Online there, or they could be users that you just simply created straight up in the cloud and have them leverage it. Obviously, most organizations that have an established on-premises environment, especially an established Active Directory um, uh, in their internal organization, typically will have users synchronized into the cloud using a tool such as the Azure AD Connect. Now, very high level from a signaling perspective, you look in the top right, you'll see John, right? He's signing in to Skype for Business Online. All of that communication is going to the Skype for Business Online infrastructure, right? So that goes to our point earlier where we said the external SIP DNS points at Skype for Business Online. That's where the logins are happening, right? John's not signing in through the edge server that's in the cloud connector. Nope, we don't, we don't deal with that, right? This cloud connector is specifically for the function of connecting us to the PSTN. So when John signs in his Skype for Business client, he goes and talks to the online infrastructure. Now, when he goes to make a call, right, and that call goes uh, through the PSTN, well, in this instance, now we have to route that call from the online infrastructure down to Cloud Connector, right? So now the call that John is making, he's calling his favorite pizza shop down the street, for example, uh, that call comes from the Skype for Business online infrastructure to the Cloud Connector edge, from that edge to mediation, and based on the defined configuration that we have, and we'll go over here in a little bit, from mediation to the corresponding gateway for the call to be signaled out to the public switch telephone network. And from a media perspective, uh, media traffic in this case, because John is external, we have a media relay component on edge, uh, and that's how uh, we've typically done media that I'm sure uh, many of you have heard various presentations that we've done in the past on how we do ice stun and turn. All of those mechanisms are there for the media relay uh, components of edge. From edge, of course, media then goes to mediation and from mediation to the gateway, right? In this particular instance, of course, since John is outside, there wouldn't be an opportunity for media bypass anyway. Um, but as we get a little bit further into the presentation, we'll get into some more detailed call flows and look at a little bit more of the, uh, the various scenarios that we, uh, that we can encounter. Now, so you got a little bit of an understanding of what Cloud Connector is and why we use it. Let's talk about the deployment planning process because this is without a doubt the most critical step in the process, hands down, right? First and foremost, follow the TechNet documentation that we have under plan for Skype for Business Cloud Connector Edition. That's pretty descriptive, pretty good guidance that we have there to help you with the planning process. Additionally, go and check out our skypeoperationsframework.com site uh, for some additional guidance around um, how we think about the planning process and envisioning process for Cloud PBX, including our Cloud Connector Edition. Next, we have to think about planning capacity for that particular site, as well as what kind of PSTN connectivity we have at this site, meaning is it a, a centralized SIP trunk model that we're doing for PSTN connectivity? Is it local? PSTN connectivity that's happening at each respective site, right? So we need to think through what that planning process uh, would be for connectivity, as well as how many calls do we think are gonna go through this particular environment, right? And that's capacity planning from the cloud connector side of things, as well as capacity planning for the circuits themselves. Firewalls, 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 right? Make sure that all of the required ports are open in your firewalls. We've got some slides coming up here in a little bit that will give you that gory detail. And of course, make sure you have your tenant admin credentials, right? You're gonna need that. It sounds silly, but you are gonna need it, right? Uh, as you go and configure and deploy the Cloud Connector appliances, we're gonna ask you for a lot of credentials, including your tenant admin credentials. So we wanna make sure that we have those readily available. Now, from a requirements perspective, mentioned this earlier, but it bears mentioning again, right? No on-premises Skype for business deployment, link server 2013 deployment, they're all in the same bucket, right? No coexistence today with Cloud Connector 141 and any on-premises deployment of Skype for business. 
Second, you need a qualified IPPBX, qualified SIP trunk, qualified SBC gateway, what have you, right? Technet.microsoft.com forward slash UCOIP, right? Unified Communications Open Interoperability Program. That will show you all the qualified gateways and trunks and SBCs and so forth. Dedicated hardware. The hypervisor host that we use for Cloud Connector is dedicated for Cloud Connector, period. Right, and the link that I have listed here will give you all of the gory specs that are required from a CPU perspective and disk perspective and all that fun stuff. But um, it is a uh, dedicated hypervisor running uh, Hyper-V. Capacity, well, there's actually a couple different flavors uh, that we can deploy Cloud Connector in. There's the, what we call the larger version capacity, which is our typical um, uh, Cloud Connector version capacity, which is 500 calls per um, Cloud Connector, right? So as we start looking a little bit later, we'll talk about high availability aspects and how we can you know, get that all sorted out. But if I'm deploying a Cloud Connector appliance on the uh, dedicated hardware that we show in the link above, you can get 500 uh, concurrent calls. There is the opportunity to do a smaller version, which will allow 50 calls. And the hardware specs that we give uh, on that link, a little bit up the page, uh, will actually show you what the smaller version looks like. And that will allow you to have uh, a little bit less from a hardware uh, requirements perspective, uh, but will allow you to then only have 50 calls per Cloud Connector. Now that's a great way to introduce maybe a pilot environment or something to that effect, right? But that's the idea of the larger versus smaller. Now, as far as general guidelines, right, we'll talk more about HA coming up in a bit, but you can have up to four cloud connectors per PSTN site, right? The PSTN site is, is something that we define um, in Cloud Connector itself, and we'll, we'll show you that when we come into registering appliances in just a sec, but you can have up to four cloud connectors in a given PSTN site, which means if you're doing an N plus one model, that means at 500 per, if I have four, well, N plus one would be three active and one, you know, uh, sitting uh, idle. That would give me effectively 1,500 simultaneous calls. And technically that one's not sitting idle, but you get the idea of N plus one allowing us to have capacity where if one of the virtual, uh, one of the cl uh, cloud connector appliances were to go down, we would still be okay from a capacity standpoint. If you don't go the N plus one route, then of course, you know, higher level math, you'd have 2,000 calls that you can hit, but you know, that's what we do from this general sizing guidance. Now, of course, if you're using the smaller hardware, you've only got 50 calls. So in that scenario with N plus one, you're only dealing with 150 calls concurrent through that PSTN site. More to come later when we talk about high availability. Now, deployment planning, the host server itself. Host server itself is running Hyper-V, requires internet access, and the ability to resolve DNS publicly. We have to have the remote PowerShell components installed. And there is a specific group policy that we have to set to prevent the forceful unload of the user registry at log off. This is specifically for the CCE management service that we'll talk about in a little bit when we get into the auto update process. Now, in addition to the host server requirements, we also have to make sure that we understand that the base VM has some requirements as well, right? The base VM is the, the initial virtual machine that we're gonna use as the, uh, the, the base template to create the additional and spawn off additional virtual machines. That base VM requires internet access and public DNS resolution as well so that we can perform the auto update process. We need external DNS records for our edge servers, our edge pools. This is referring specifically to the cloud connector edge name that you're using, right? You will need to put those names into uh, public DNS. And as you'll see in a little bit, when we talk about high availability, if I happen to have, you know, three cloud connector um, appliances deployed in one site in an HA uh, environment, I would have to have the name for that edge listed three times because we will use DNS load balancing to load balance the requests to those various edge servers, right? They'll all have the same name within the same site. And you'll see this coming up in a little bit when we get into the details of HA, but external DNS records are critically important. And you do need external certificates, 
right? There's a link here that you can go read off of TechNet that will give you all the gory details of what we need, but we do need to request the external certificate and have that certificate available in a .pfx file format so that we can have that uh, imported as part of the installation and deployment process of Cloud Connector. Now, my most, one of my most favorite is slides, right? The cloudconnector.ini file. This is the most critical piece of the process, like bar none, right? Because this configuration file basically controls everything, right? From whether you're using the large to the small, uh, what the IP addresses are for edge, uh, the connections that we have to our gateways, what the IP addresses of those gateways, all of that information is in this cloudconnector.ini file. So that means you got to make sure that you don't mess this one up, right? Because if we misconfigure the INI file, you're looking at scrapping and redoing some things, right? It's the quickest way to go in and fix something that's that's a little messed up. Now, what we do, we give you a deployment checklist that you can see here, the aka.ms forward slash deploy cloud connector. That is a printable deployment checklist, and I highly recommend that you have that printed out and available because that way you can actually write down every little bit that you have to put into that cloud connector INI file. What does that file look like? Well, there isn't one by default, right? But you can generate one using the export CC configuration sample file command, right? That'll spit out a sample INI file and you can open that up. You can put in all your relevant information and then save that as cloudconnector.ini. Now you do have to have this file updated before you create the base VM, the base uh, VHDX. And at a minimum, you've got to have the values for base VM IP, corpnet default gateway, corpnet DNS IP address so that the base VM creation will succeed, right? And that goes back to the slide earlier where we said the base VM requires um, internet access, right? And public DNS access. These are the parameters that we need to make sure are right so that that base VM can get all the relevant information, right? This way it's going to be able to get its updates and, and so forth, right? Now, there's, there's a multitude of settings that you can do inside of this INI file. We're not gonna go through every single one, but I did put a link here at the bottom under special consideration values. You definitely wanna take a look at this site uh, on TechNet because out of all the various things that you see inside of the INI file, these are some of the more common ones that you are going to encounter and ones that you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have correct in the INI file itself. Now, speaking of HA and multi-site, right? We've got more to come on the gory details of this, but as you're going through the planning process, you need to consider in the HA and multi-site world, what pieces of the puzzle are the same and what pieces of the puzzle are not the same. So let's look at this middle column here where you see single site with HA. So we'll tackle the HA piece first, right? This is a scenario where we have multiple cloud connector appliances functioning within a single site, right? Remember, you can have up to four. So when I go to deploy this, there's a few things that we need to realize. First off, there's a shared folder, right, that we're going to get into when we look at the, you know, the actual configuration steps. That is the same shared folder across all of our instances, right? So all of my cloud connector appliances hit that same shared folder. When I go through the configuration aspects, you'll see things like the virtual machine domain, right? Well, in the uh, single site with HA, it's gonna be the same, right? Across my instances. My SIP domains are gonna be the same. My site name, of course, is going to be the same because it's a single site with HA, right? Those four cloud connector appliances are in the same site, hence the site name is all the same. When I look at things such as the external FQDN, right? That's the FQDN that we use to connect to edge. That will be the same across all of my instances. So again, if this is a single site and I have four cloud connector appliances deployed, each of those cloud connector appliances will use the same name for the F F external FQDN of edge. That means that I'll then have four entries in my public DNS, right? Because this is DNS load balancing. So if I'm using you know, MR as my media relay, so mr.contoso.com, 
right? I'll have that entered four times into public DNS, one for each public IP address that each of the Cloud Connector Edge appliances have. You'll see things like our um, hybrid tenant information, where we look at peer destination and hybrid PSTN site. Right. We'll get into this more as we dig into HA, but you know, peer destination is so that when a call comes in or a call is trying to uh, exit, if you will, the Office 365 environment, it knows what peer edge environment to hit. If you only have one site, you can simply set peer destination and all calls will always go out that one site that has these cloud connectors. When you have a multi-site environment, you'll see that you actually will assign users to given sites so that uh, user A can go out site one and user B could go out site two, but you can also then set peer destination as a fallback. So in the event that user um, B is going out site two and site two is down, the peer fallback could be site one and you know out we go. More to come on that again when we get into the HA aspects. Gateway, um, the M to N construct, right? Where we can have um, the mediation server is talking to multiple gateways. We'll cover that more as we get into HA as well um, and understanding how all of that maps in. But this is a really useful table to have available. It's also available in our TechNet documentation, um, but it's really helpful as you're going through the planning process so that you know exactly what pieces of the puzzle go where, which ones are the same and which ones are different. Firewalls. Yeah, just allow IP any, any, and we're fine. Yeah, no, that's not gonna work, just kidding. So when we look at firewalls, right, we have to look at a couple aspects, right? Because when we deploy the cloud connector appliances, they are actually deployed in a DMZ, right? Because they need to have the ability to connect to the external uh, and have connections coming in from the external environment, from the internet, but they also need to be able to talk to internal environments as well. So the cloud connector appliances will actually get deployed in the DMZ. That typically means that there's gonna be multiple firewalls involved. There's gonna be an internal firewall, right? That controls what Cloud Connector can talk to on your internal network and what on your internal network can talk to Cloud Connector. That's the chart that you see here, right? So we've given you the, the base set of ports that are required for the various components from Cloud Connector talking to various uh, other internal components, right? So you can see the first you know, six lines that we have here are, mediation to gateway, right? And mediation to clients. And then the last couple you see are clients to mediation, right? So this is all of the um, firewall requirements that are needed for um, the inside part of Cloud Connector, if you will, right? To be able to talk across the internal firewall to your internal network. When we look at the port ranges, right? You can see that we have a Default port range, this is going to the first asterisk that you see in the last two rows, TCP uh, 49152 to 57500. This is the default port range on the mediation component. Uh, when we think about optimal call flow, four ports per call are required, and you do have opportunities to adjust port ranges as necessary, but these are the default port ranges that we have set up, right? Uh, the port that you see, um, for the gateway, this is the very first line, mediation component, you see destination port TCP 5060. That's an example, right? It may, it may be 5060, it may not. That depends on the gateway that you're using, right? It's quite probable that maybe the gateway you're using is listening on 5061 and not 5060. That's an example port. So make sure, of course, that you update that 5060 to the respective port that you need. And then, of course, you can limit the port range, as I said before, on your SBC or gateway, um, if allowed, based on the configurations of uh, the SBC or the gateway itself. Now, the external firewall side, at a minimum, these are the components that we require uh, from a configuration standpoint on the external firewall, right? And of course, this basically all goes to edge, right? So this is um, any coming into edge and then from edge going out. Right, most particularly, uh, you'll see the standard TCP 5061, right? That's required, that's for the SIP signaling traffic. You will see the Cloud Connector Edge external interface, this is lines three and four, going to TCP 80 and UDP 53, right? 
the NTCP53, I should add the next one as well, right? That's for web browsing, for downloading the CRL for certificate revocation lists, and for DNS requests, UDP TCP53, right? Uh, you've got UDP3478 and TCP443, right? Those are our typical stun turn um, ports that we have. And then you do notice that we have the high ports of 50,000 to 59,999 as a source port, right? Going to destination 443 um, based on the direction that you see here. This is the minimum requirement that we have. And as a result, you know, because if you just follow this minimum process, you might end up and have some hairpinning between your client going to the online edge, online edge to the on premises edge in Cloud Connector and then in. So as a result, we typically recommend that you look at the second option here, which is what we call the recommended external firewall config, right? And you can see a slightly different approach here for the destination ports, right? You see the destination ports are not just um, UDP 3478, TCP 443, but also include the high ports of TCP 50,000 to 59,999 and UDP 50,000 to 59,999. Highly recommended that we go the uh, the route that you see here for our external firewall to allow us to have an optimal media flow uh, from our clients through Cloud Connector. So I've done all my planning. I've triple checked all of my planning. It all looks good. What do I do now? Well, from a deployment perspective, first we prepare the host appliance. And remember, this is a dedicated uh, physical appliance uh, that is running Hyper-V. We download and install the Cloud Connector software, and then we create the share that we need. Um, typically, you'll do this from the first appliance, but make sure that you share this with read-write access to all appliances that you're gonna have in the site. Now, of course, if you're only gonna have one, that's pretty straightforward, but if you are going to deploy it in an HA mode where we have multiple Cloud Connectors in the same site, then we have to make sure that the share is created with the appropriate read-write access for all of the appliances in the site. Then we can use set CC site directory to point that at the shared folder using our standard UNC you know, uh, naming, UNC path. Then we can do start CC download to start downloading the Cloud Connector bits. At this point, we wanna make sure that we update the Cloud Connector INI file with all the goodies, right? Make sure this is all right based on that planning workbook that you printed out, right? Then we can run the convert dash CC ISO to VHDX. This is something you have to do one time only. You as a customer or a IT pro need to provide the server ISO. This is a server 2012 R2 ISO. This is not provided as part of Cloud Connector, right? So we need to make sure that we have the appropriate ISO. Then we can run this commandlet and that will generate that base VHDX that we need. You only have to do that um, on the first appliance that you deploy in the site. Once that's VHDX is created, you can then copy and paste it and it can be used for the other appliances in the site. We then have set CC external certificate file path. Where is my certificate? As I mentioned before, we need to have the certificate ahead of time with the appropriate names as a PFX file with the private key. Of course, don't forget the password for that as well. Then we can go ahead and do register CC appliance. Now you will register all of your appliances before you actually deploy them. Right? And this is to ensure that all of the appliances now know about all of the other appliances and that Office 365 now knows, hey, this is a site that has three appliances in it. So it can track, okay, there's three appliances in the site. You successfully deployed two. There's still one more to go. So let's get that last one um, deployed. Right? Then we can do install CC appliance. Again, we add our DNS A records for the Access Edge FQDN. And again, if it's an HA deployment, you're going to put multiple A records right out in public DNS, same name, but different IPs. And then lastly, we'll configure the PSTN gateways, right? Any of the options that we might need to set on our PSTN gateways. Now, you look at the bold items here. Those are the ones that you have to do only once and really on the first, only on the first appliance in the site. All right, so that's a quick synopsis of what the deployment process itself looks like. Um, for cloud connectors. So let's let's dig a little bit deeper into some of these topics and see what we can uh, see what we can see here. First and foremost is registration. So we say that your first step is to is to you know when we start to do this deployment is to register these appliances. Why? Why do we care about registering our appliance? Well, there's two main reasons. 
for um, uh, management of the appliance and for the high availability aspects, especially with the mediation server. So take a look here. If I look at appliance management, when I register the appliance, and remember if I'm putting multiple at a site, I'll register all of them all at the same time, right, before I deploy anything. I can then run get CS hybrid PSTN site, and it will actually be able to tell me what sites I have and what cloud connector appliances are in those respective sites. Right, so here I've run get CS hybrid PSTN site, and on the left you can actually see that there's two different sites. There's an HA site and there's a corp site. Right? If I had um, only a single site deployed, then of course I would only see one of these PSTN sites. But from here, I can then also see things like, well, what's the edge FQDN that's associated with this site? Do we have auto update turned on? What are the time windows? And that's the second screenshot that talks more about the update time windows. We will get more into that uh, when we get to the auto update section. So for now, just realize that the cool thing about registering the appliance is we get some ability to do um, reporting and management of the appliance itself. Now, the second reason we register an appliance is for mediation server high availability. Right? Remember we talked before that the Cloud Connector appliance is just that. Think of it like an appliance, an extension to O365. And one of the functions of one of the VMs on there is mediation. Well, when I'm deploying four Cloud Connectors in a particular site, as an example, and I want them all to operate harmoniously, well, they all need to know about each other, don't they? Right? You can't. It wouldn't really make sense to have four cloud connectors and not have them all know about each other. Well, by registering the appliance, we actually will know all of the mediation servers on all of the appliances in that particular PSTN site. So you can see here, I actually have, I've, I've run my command line here to look at my site and you can see the site name is HA site two for both of these. And you can see the first one I have highlighted, CC Mediation 1, and then the second one, CC Mediation 2, right? So you can actually see these are two different appliances with two different mediation servers, yet every appliance knows that now, right? Because it's actually part of the topology. In fact, if you want to dig down into the, the topology itself, you can actually export uh, the, the topology and look, and you'll see the exact same thing, right? You'll actually see it as a mediation pool, right? With multiple mediation servers in it. One mediation server is on Cloud Connector Appliance 1, and one mediation server is on Cloud Connector Appliance 2. Pretty nifty, right? And all of this information is um, available and published in the topology, and now, all of the Cloud Connector appliances know about the uh, mediation servers that are there. Pretty cool. So what about this, this high availability aspect, right? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you can have up to four Cloud Connectors in one given PSTN site. Right now, again, remember that the PSTN calling site is a, a definition that we have inside of um, Cloud Connector and the service itself, right? So we define when we register the appliance, that's going to allow us to define the site name itself. Calls themselves are distributed in a random order between the Cloud Connectors, right? So in this particular uh, image that you see here, I have Cloud Connector 1 and Cloud Connector 2. These are two separate appliances deployed in the same site, right? So they're going to act as one, essentially. Now, when the calls come in from the outside world, right, we're going to use DNS load balancing to figure out which cloud connector we route them to. But for the purposes of call distribution, it's going to be a random pick uh, between the cloud connectors themselves. As mentioned earlier, when we start looking at these, we have to think about capacity planning. You get on the standard, you know, the large, as we call it, configuration, you get 500 concurrent calls per cloud connector. So four cloud connectors per site gives you 2,000. If we do an N plus one model, then we would calculate at 1,500, right? So that we have room for um, uh, the availability aspect in case one of the cloud connector appliances goes down, right? But that's how we basically do our, our capacity planning aspect. And then of course, that's gonna align to whatever your, your, your SLA is, but 
um, we do want to think about ensuring that we have high availability uh, when we deploy our cloud connectors. Now at a real high level, right? There's John at the top right. And again, as we mentioned before, when John signs in, he signs into the online infrastructure. Nothing comes to edge for sign in, right? All the DNS records for sign in and whatnot are pointing to online. So he signs into online and now John's gonna make a call to his favorite pizza shop down the street, right? So he's got a contact for it, right? Click call. This is an outbound PSTN call. This call, has to be routed out to the PSDN, in this case, going through Cloud Connector. Well, John's account is actually assigned to this particular PSTN site. And I'll show you how to do that in just a second. But John, we'll press I believe for now, right? John's account is assigned to this PSTN site. So when the call goes out, the online infrastructure can route the call down to the Cloud Connectors in this particular site. Now, again, it's gonna pick one of them. In this instance, it picked Cloud Connector 1, and signals the call to that edge component. The call then goes from that edge to mediation then from mediation to the corresponding gateway as necessary and as we've configured inside of our INI file. From a media perspective, John's outside the network, so he has the ability to send media through edge as a media relay, just like a regular old Skype for business client would, right? Media can then go from edge to mediation, mediation to the corresponding gateway. Now, I take a second user, like Corneal, down at the bottom here. Again, he signs into online. Life's good. He makes an outbound call. Same idea, right? Corneal is assigned to this same PSTN site. Right? And then in this particular instance, we happen to send him to Cloud Connector 2. Random call distribution. We happen to pick Cloud Connector 2, and away we go. Process, same, right? Edge to mediation, mediation to corresponding gateway. Media from Corneal goes to the media relay through Edge, and away we go. Very high level understanding of what we're doing from a signaling and media perspective. Now, some things to think about when we're deploying HA, especially with regards to these mediation pools, right? When you do the initial deployment, you first register the appliance, right? And that creates the existence of this appliance and the PSDN site in Office 365. Right, you'll do that for each appliance that you have um, deployed. So let's say, for example, today I deploy two, right? So I deploy two cloud connector appliances and I go and I do the register on each of them. And then I go and I do an in the install on each of them. And they're all happy because at that particular moment, they all know about everybody. And we're grilling some s'mores around the campfire. It's great. But now I realize, huh, that's only giving me a capacity of a thousand. Maybe I want to up the capacity. So I'm going to add a third cloud connector appliance to this site. So I bring that hardware online and I register it to the O365 um, environment. Of course, at this point, because I've you know updated my INI file and all that good stuff, the third cloud connector appliance knows all, right? He knows about the first two, but the first two don't know about the third one. Well, there's an easy way to fix that, right? On the first and second, uh, cloud connector appliances, we can actually run the publish CC appliance command. What that basically does is uh, instruct those two to update their existing topology based on you know what the last guy just registered. And now they'll suddenly realize, hey, there's actually three mediation servers in this pool now, not two, because we just added this third appliance. Now I can go back to appliance number three and do the install. Right, and that goes and checks O365 and updates topology, and you know life is good. Maybe I went a little overboard and I deployed too many, and I said, "Huh, I got to take one of these guys away." No worries, right? We have three, and now we decided, "Oops, got to downsize to two. We go to this third one. We unregister the appliance, which will remove its existence from the topology and from O365. But then again, you've got to go to those remaining ones and do a publish, right, so that we can make sure that they realize that that third mediation server has been removed from the environment. Okay, so media flow. Well, let's look, we've got an outbound call from an internal user going to the PSTN. So there you see number one, we have Dave. Dave is sitting on our corporate network. 
He, of course, signs in to O365, talking to the Office 365 infrastructure, the Skype for Business Online infrastructure, right? Nothing is going through Cloud Connector at this point. He's just simply signing in to Skype for Business Online. And now he makes an external PSTN call. He calls somebody's cell phone, calls the pizza shop, calls whatever. When the call gets to the Skype for Business Online infrastructure, the phone number gets there, we perform a reverse number lookup, you know, to see if he's calling another internal user. In this case, he's not. He's calling some dude's cell phone or he's calling that, you know, that, that fun restaurant down the street. So now we realize, hey, this is an outbound call. So in this case, the call needs to be routed to Cloud Connector. Right, specifically that edge component of Cloud Connector, but because we think of it as this extension to Skype for Business Online, we just make the routing decision that says, oh, this is an outbound call. Well, let me check and see Dave. Dave is assigned to site one. I'm gonna send that to the corresponding access edge name that I have for site one, or the peer destination name if I've configured that, right? And now we send the request from the online infrastructure over SIP, to Edge, which then next hops to mediation and goes to the corresponding gateway based on the configuration that we have inside of uh, our Cloud Connector INI file. Now, that takes care of signaling, right? What about media? Well, in this case, Dave is inside the network, so he can actually send his media into the mediation server. Now, remember, he can't send it directly to the gateway because we don't yet support media bypass, but He's not sending it up to Office 365 and on back. He's just simply sending it on net to your mediation server uh, that's on Cloud Connector. So think of it as he's just sending media to Cloud Connector and it goes then from Cloud Connector to the gateway. If you wanted to, and if your you know, gateway manufacturer supports it, you can change the media ports that you use um, if you so desire. Just again, remember that's a firewall there. So make sure that you've got your firewall rules set appropriately for the inside network. So how about uh, an inbound call to an internal user from the PSTN, right? So we, we looked at Dave making that outbound call. Well. Maybe he called that person's cell phone and they didn't answer, so he left a message, and now they're gonna call him back. Okay, well, they dial Dave's number. The call comes in where you see the number one at the PSTN gateway. It comes in through the PSTN circuit that is on-premises. This gateway is configured to send its traffic next hopped to Cloud Connector, in this case, to the mediation server specific component of Cloud Connector. But for the purposes of kind of thinking is this as an appliance, right? The gateway sends it to Cloud Connector. Now inside of that mediation next hops it to Edge. Edge then sends it to online. The request reaches the online infrastructure and says, this is a phone call for, and here's the phone number. Well, we look at that phone number, we do a reverse number lookup and we go, hey, that's Dave. Yeah, so we're now going to send a toast to Dave, right? So now Dave gets that toast in his client because the signaling has now reached down to his endpoint or multiple endpoints if he has MPOP, right? Multiple endpoints signed in. Um, and he gets the toast and now he has the opportunity to uh, answer the call. From a media perspective, again, the media is gonna go from the gateway to Cloud Connector and then from Cloud Connector to Dave because he's on the internal network, right? Again, more specifically, it's the mediation component of Cloud Connector, but the call goes from gateway to Cloud Connector, Cloud Connector to Dave from a media perspective. And yes, as mentioned before, you could limit those ports um, as needed from a gateway perspective. Now, what about this concept of gateway affinity, right? If you're at all familiar with how we do Skype for Business server on premises, you know that we have this concept of M to N uh, for mediation servers to gateways, which means you know one mediation server pool can talk to multiple gateways and one gateway can talk to multiple mediation servers, right? That's the, the M to N construct. Well, that's available as well when we look at Cloud Connector, right? So you can actually see here I have these two cloud connectors, cloud connector one, cloud connector two. The first cloud connector instance is able to talk to all three gateways, gateway one, two, three, as well as the second cloud connector instance is configured to talk to gateways one, two, and three. The gateway that's chosen 
uh, will be done on a round robin order. You do have options to set preferred gateways, but if not, we can do it in a round robin fashion. If we try to send it, say, for example, to gateway one, and he can't accept the call, it can be redetected uh, uh, and, and rerouted to another gateway. Of course, to have full HA, it's great to have multiple cloud connectors, but you should also then have at least multiple gateways because otherwise you have a single point of failure, right? And then of course, from a um, planning capacity perspective, don't forget about sizing your gateways as appropriate as well, right? If you put in multiple cloud connectors and you can handle 1500 simultaneous calls, and then you put in one gateway with a single T1, that's probably not going to end very well for you since I only got 23 channels on that T1, right? So don't forget about the sizing of the gateway um, and uh, corresponding circuits there so that we can align that with the SLA that we're calculating for Cloud Connector itself. So what about multiple site scenarios, right? We've talked up to this point about this HA construct, which is multiple Cloud Connectors within a given site, but we also have the capability of having a multiple site scenario. So you can see here, my first visual representation here is Seattle. This is also known as PSTN site one because we're not very creative with our names. So there's PSTN site one. And you can see within that site, I actually have two cloud connector appliances deployed. So I have high availability within that site, but then I also have multiple sites because you can then see that I have a secondary site here for Amsterdam, right? which aptly named PSDN, uh, PSDN site two. And that one also has multiple cloud connector appliances deployed in it. Now, when we set up a multi-site scenario, right, we have the opportunity to assign users to given sites. So for example, you can see in the top right, John is assigned to PSTN site one, whereas Cornel at the bottom is assigned to PSTN site Two. That means that when John makes his outbound calls, the online infrastructure will route it to the cloud connectors that are in site one, and it'll pick randomly, right? But it'll always go to site one. Whereas when Cornel makes his outbound calls, they will always go to PSTN site two, right? And you can see on the left-hand side here, we put some specifics around how you assign that particular um, site. I will cover that in a dedicated slide coming up. So it's really here just more for reference, but I'll get into the details of that coming up here. Now, there is no DR per se between sites. And let me explain what that, what that means, right? Um, it, it is possible to set what's called peer destination. We looked at that earlier in one of the slides, um, which would be if a user didn't really have a site defined, we would go out that, that um, peer destination. But in the event that let's say that Amsterdam um, goes offline for whatever reason, right? There's no automated DR that's going to now have Cornel's calls go out through PSDN site one. Um, of course, you could go into the online console and just change his site assignment, right? And that would allow his calls to go out. But that doesn't help with inbound calls. And then you have to be very cognizant of what's happening there when you cross country boundaries, right? Because now we're talking about, you know, an outbound call from a, um, an Amsterdam or Netherlands, you know, number going out of a gateway in Seattle. So you'd want to make sure that that would be taken care of from the gateways perspective and so forth. So that's why we say there's no DR between sites from an automated standpoint, um, because we, we do have options of reassigning them to different sites, but then you also have to consider the inbound calling perspective. And that's going to be something that's up to your carrier and how you've deployed uh, your gateways on site. Okay, so we talked a little bit about that process that we go through. We've got these things all deployed, all the appliances are there, they're registered, they're happy, they're ready to go. What do we do next? Right, well, next thing is you configure your tenant. Right, so we set up hybrid. You see the commands here set CS tenant federation configuration with dash shared SIP address space to true. Right, that establishes hybrid between the cloud connector environment and the Office 65 tenant. Then you can do uh, set CS tenant hybrid configuration dash peer destination. Right, that's the that would be the default cloud connector. Right, that um, dash peer destination external access edge FQDN. 
that would be the, the default cloud connector or cloud connectors in a particular site that you would use if you didn't happen to assign a user to a given PSTN site. The best practice is to assign users to PSTN site so that it's very controlled, but this is kind of that fallback that you can use. Or of course, if you're just deploying one single site, you could simply just set this and then not have to worry about assigning sites to individual users. Another option there of use on-prem dial plan false. Uh, Got to set that because there is no on-prem dial plan because there's nothing on premises, right? That uh, that handles dial plans, registrars, things of that nature, right? It's all coming from online, so there is no on-prem dial plan to use. Now, new in the one for one release is automated updates. Now, automated updates are pretty nifty because they provide the ability to automatically update the host and the virtual machines from an OS perspective, as well as updating the actual Cloud Connector editions, right? And by addition, I mean, this is edition 1.4.1, right? So whatever the next version is that we come out with, you know, 148, 15, 1, whatever, right? That's a new edition. Automatic updates takes care of updating that as well. You can configure appropriate time windows for these updates to occur. And really, as a tenant administrator, that's the only thing you really have to be concerned about from an updates perspective is, what time window do I want these updates to occur in? Right? Again, thinking of Cloud Connector as an extension to Skype for Business Online, as improvements are made to the service, the expectation is that there's a base, a minimum version configuration that's happening at the Cloud Connectors. That's why we want auto update to ensure that these things are always in line with the latest and greatest versions that we have deployed in the cloud. Now the auto update process actually builds a new set of virtual machines in the background, right? So you're running with your current version, everything's doing fine. We're turning around in the background, building a new set of VMs. We then drain the active traffic from your running VM sets and then do a switch to the new VM sets. That's how the auto update process works. The existing VMs themselves will remain in case there's a problem during the upgrade, we can always flip back to them or switch back to them. Um, but that's how the process in a nutshell is gonna work for auto updates. Now, as a result, again, think of those VMs as kind of sealed VMs, right? Because the auto update process is going to churn out a new set of these, right? It's not gonna do you any good to install antivirus software or anything like that inside of the virtual machines themselves because think of them as sealed, right? They're, they're going to get repurposed and rebuilt when we go through this auto update process. Uh, certainly, of course, the host itself, we can take care of installing AV there, um, but the actual virtual machines themselves, just think of that as a sealed appliance. How do you configure auto update? Well, as I mentioned earlier, really the only thing you have to be worried about is A, is it turned on? And B, when can it happen, right? So there's a property called enable auto update that you set to true that turns on the ability for auto updates to happen. And you can just simply use set CS hybrid PSTN site for that. And you can verify it with the get command. Then you can go ahead and create custom auto update time windows, right? Now these windows by themselves don't really do anything. Right, but these actually define the day of week or day, time, duration, so forth, right? So you can see here, I gave you a couple examples. Uh, new CS tenant update time window identity night, running daily with a start time of 2200 with a duration of six hours, right? So that's every night, 2200, six hours, six hour window. The second one is weekday night. So only during the days of the week, Monday through Friday, right? And only for four hours. And then the last one is midday of month. So once a month on the 15th, you know, at midnight for an hour. You can have up to 20 of these custom auto update time windows. But again, as I said, just setting up the time window doesn't do anything, right? The next thing you have to do is actually assign the auto update time window to your PSTN site or sites themselves. And that's simply done with the set CS hybrid PSTN site commandlet. Now, when you set this, there are actually two different app uh, uh, parameters that you set. There's the bits update time and the OS update time. They could be the same, they could be different. So in this particular example, we set the bits update time window to be the midday of month um, with you know weekday of night, uh, weekday night, so that we've got, you know, it doesn't matter. It's always during a day of the week of Monday through Friday, but only when that date is the 15th, and then only when we have you know this particular duration. 
Um, and then, you know, OS update time window is replaced at night. So the OS update is running um, every night at 2200 hours. You would then assign these to all of your given PSTN sites um, as required across the deployment. So now we got the appliances deployed. We've got auto update rocking. What's next? Well, now we got to get our users, right? The users need to be using Cloud PBX. Typically, that's part of E5, or it could be a standalone Cloud PBX license that's assigned to the user. Conferencing, you assign an advanced meeting add-on uh, as part of E5, or again, a standalone license. Conferencing is serviced by the online environment. This goes for dial-in conferencing as well. Okay, the dial-in piece always comes from the service, right? You do not have the opportunity to bring a dial-in conferencing number in through Cloud Connector and then go to online. That's not going to work, right? It all comes from online. Then we go and enable our users, right? So get CS online user, my user pipe to set CS user. I do enterprise voice enabled true, hosted voicemail true, on-prem line URI to whatever their phone number is, right? So if this were Alice, I could put in her phone number as telco and plus, and then the E164 phone number. Second option you see here is get CS online user dash identity. In this case, maybe dash identity, you know, Alice, and then pipe that to enable CS online UM mailbox. Now this is a little tricky one, right? Technically speaking, we don't use UM, right? Voicemail is provided by cloud voicemail. Um, in uh, Office 365. We deposit the voicemail in the user's Exchange mailbox, but it's not Exchange UM that's, that's actually doing it. The reason we have to set this though is currently in order for the client itself to light up the voicemail features, it's expecting to see a UM piece configured. So that's why we do this middle step of enable CS online UM mailbox. And if that, if you don't have a UM dial plan, you'll need to create one. I give you a step here to show you how to do a new CS online UM dial plan. But this just basically sets the attributes right on the account so that the client will light up the right things in the interface for you to see your visual voicemail. But point of clarification, we do not actually use Exchange Unified Messaging um, for voicemail, right? It's just there to be able to light up those features in the client. Then you see the last one, set CS user PSTN settings, dash identity, this would be Alice, uh, dash hybrid PSTN site, and the name of the site, which is case sensitive. This is where you tie the user to a site that has cloud connector or cloud connectors deployed in it, right? So this is back to our earlier example where, you know, John was going out Seattle and Cornel was going out Amsterdam. This is where you tie the users to a particular PSTN site. If so desired, you can restrict international dialing by doing grant CS voice routing policy um, with the policy name of international call disallowed to uh, uh, kill the ability for them to make an international call. From a manageability perspective, there is a new service that is installed on the hypervisor host itself. So on your uh, actual um, Hyper-V host, we install the cloud connector management service. Um, and it's responsible for running the auto recovery and auto update pieces. Um, it will log events into the application log in Windows under the source CCE management service. Um, so you can actually go in there and see what's going on and see what it's monitoring and what it's seeing and what it's not seeing. Um, and it does dump logs into program files, uh, Sky for Business Cloud Connector Edition management service. Again, that is on the hypervisor itself. You can run some standard PowerShell commandlets um, on Cloud Connector, you know, where applicable. So like CLS logging, you can turn on CLS logging and, and gather some logs there. Um, you will not need to use and should not ever use Topology Builder, right? Again, think of these as kind of sealed up VMs, right? They're, they're not your typical on-premises deployment, so don't treat them like one, right? Don't fire up Topology Builder and do silly things. Um, if you have to modify the deployment, the topology after you've done the deployment, like, oops, I, I fat fingered the name of something in the Cloud Connector INI file, you should fix the configuration and start again, right? Unregister stuff, uninstall stuff, fix the INI, re-register and start again. And then lastly, um, think about any gateway considerations that you may need to have, right? You can use commandlets like set CS trunk configuration uh, between your Cloud Connector's mediation server and uh, the gateway to be, enable things like refer. 
um, if that's necessary, or forward PAI for the pre-asserted identity, right? Those are options that you can configure on the trunks between Cloud Connector and your gateways as appropriate. Now, one of the cool things about the management service is it can actually um, surface information into online PowerShell in regards to errors and registration status. Right, so here, the first option you see, I did a get CS hybrid PSDN appliance. And as I look at this appliance, I see that it's in uh, site name HA site two. And about halfway down, you'll see registration status registered and deployed, status error. Uh oh, well, that's not good. Right, and under error, I can read RTC SRV not found or not running. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. Right, so the RTC service, in this case, the RTC service on edge isn't running. Actually, if you go and look in the event viewer, you'd be able to see the same thing. Uh, the nice thing about this CCE management service is it can see that, it can detect that, and it can try to restart that service, right? And then in, in this particular instance, it was able to get that RTC service restarted. So now I run that same command again, get CS hybrid PSDN appliance, and you can see now that our Registration status is registered and deployed, and status is now running, which is good. I like it. Cool. So last but not least, if you happen to be running an existing version of Cloud Connector, say, for example, the 1.3.8 version, we encourage you to upgrade to 1.4.1. Um, cool thing being, this would be the last time you have to upgrade, right? Because auto-update will take over from here. Um, so how do I do it? Well, how do I upgrade? Well, you uninstall the existing version in control panel. This is on the hypervisor host, right? You'll uninstall it. You'll go to aka.ms forward slash cloud connector installer, and you'll install the new version. Now, this is where it gets interesting, right? At this point, you need to get the new INI file version. Remember, you can export a sample of it, right? But you need to get the latest and greatest INI file version and make sure it's updated with all of your specific information and have that available on each of the cloud connectors that you're gonna be updating, right? Now, the upgrade process is actually pretty straightforward. We do a start CC download, we do a register of the appliance again, right? And that's registering of the appliance with the new information from the new INI, new formatted INI file. Then we can run install CC appliance with the dash upgrade switch. And that will go and build the new set of VMs in the background, right? Get everything all uh, prepped and ready to go. And then once that process is complete at our discretion, we can then do switch CC version and flip us over now from say 138 to 141. If you have multiple appliances deployed in an HA fashion, you would repeat this process for each of the appliances in a given site, being sure to do them one at a time, wait for that one to complete and register and report successfully, then continue on to the next. In a multi-site environment, you'll just repeat that same process one site at a time. Right, one cloud connector appliance at a time per site. Once we finish the site, then we move on to the next one. And of course, you make sure you validate all throughout this process. And last but not least, during this process, if you need to reset any of the credentials, you'll have the opportunity to do so using install CC appliance with dash update all credentials. That way, when you run that upgrade switch, it'll run you through the, the prompts again for what passwords do you wanna use for the administrator accounts and so on and so forth. Um, if all of that is good, but maybe the only thing you need to tweak is the tenant admin credentials, then you can run set CC credential with dash account type tenant admin, and that will allow you to update your tenant administrator uh, credentials for Cloud Connector. Excellent. Well, I hope this has been helpful for you. Uh, this kind of a recap takes you through a little bit about what Cloud Connector is, right? Ensuring that we understand uh, that Cloud Connector is this extension to the Skype for Business Online environment. Um, it is meant to be thought of as an appliance, right? Something that uh, has the ability to now uh, auto update itself, uh, providing new mechanisms for high availability and providing us an excellent way to provide and extend our Cloud PBX services to environments where uh, we have existing on-premises PSTN connectivity. Thank you for your time.